the arabic language a lecture given on december third eighteen sixty eight by thomas cheenery m a of christchurch lord almoner's professor of arabic in the university of oxford this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abu Jalal, Nicholas James Bridgewater. The Arabic Language, given on December 3rd, 1868, by Thomas Cheenery. It would ill become me, in addressing members of the University of Oxford, to begin by urging the importance of a study of the Arabic language such a preface might be in place before a popular assembly with narrow notions not only of language but even of what constitutes utility a learned body which cultivates with activity and success every branch of knowledge does not need to be persuaded that one of the most perfect and beautiful forms of human speech one of the most widely extended most enduring and most influential languages of the world is worthy of the attention of its students and if there were any tendency to overlook its importance for there is a fashion in studies as in other things and the curiosity which attracts to new subjects sometimes causes whole departments of learning to be neglected for a time i should be forbidden to recognize it by the very conditions under which i address you the merit of the arabic language literature and history as a study for europeans is the very reason of my own professional existence i am bound to assume that when the successive sovereigns of this kingdom have for more than a century and a half maintained a professorship of arabic in either university there is a sufficient reason for their bounty and since the lord almoner has done me the honour to appoint me to the office and the university to admit me to it i will not enter on an argument which would seem to assume that the acts of such high authorities need a justification i am also bound to recollect that the university maintains the laudian professorship which has been distinguished by the names of several eminent scholars the first of whom the illustrious pocock will always be had in remembrance wherever eastern learning is cultivated indeed the study of arabic in this university may be traced back to a still more distant age at the council of vienna in the early part of the fourteenth century pope clement v addressed a command to the universities of rome paris oxford bologna and salerno that they should appoint teachers of the hebrew chaldee and arabic tongues for the purpose of raising up scholars who should be competent to defend the christian theology against its most learned adversaries the doctors of judaism and islam authority so high in times remote and recent enables me to yield to my own inclination and to omit an apology for arabic which will not be demanded by men of literary tastes and which even if far more cogent than i could make it would probably have little effect on those who are without them it will be best to devote the brief space of this lecture to a definition of the arabic language absolutely 
and in its relations with its cognate tongues, or with the chief of those which it has influenced by means of religion or conquest. And then to such a slight sketch of its literary features as will indicate how, in my judgment, it may best be studied. You are aware that the Arabic is a member of the remarkable and well-defined family of languages to which the convenient, though not strictly accurate name of Semitic has been given. This family comprises the well-known tongues which have long been the subject of investigation to European scholars, the Hebrew, the Eastern and Western Aramaic, commonly distinguished as Chaldee and Syriac, the Arabic and the Ethiopian. It comprises also, it would seem, one or more of the idioms spoken in the valleys of the Euphrates and Tigris, preserved in the cuneiform inscriptions, and now gradually emerging into light through the marvellous researches of our own time. Confining ourselves to the former group, where we are on sure ground, we find a literary character and a philological system which may well excite our curiosity. The most prominent quality of these languages is a similarity which can hardly be distinguished from identity. When it is said of European languages that they resemble each other, the phrase is used with great latitude. It merely means that there is such a likeness between the words and the grammatical forms of each as may be perceived by an educated man whose intelligence will enable him to trace the divergences wrought by time and separation between dialects which have had a common origin or were at least in some former age much more closely related the tendency of our languages to phonetic variation or decay and the impulse of our more mobile races to new turns of thought and expression have produced a changeableness in speech which is only checked not wholly removed by a literary culture but unchangeableness is the law or the fate of the semitic tongues According to the mould in which they were first cast, they exist from age to age, unvaried in their substantial structure, their development being superficial, or at least unessential, and resembling rather the slight efflorescence of the mineral than the exuberant vegetative growth of Aryan speech. It is not too bold a generalisation to say that the Hebrew the Aramaic and the Arabic are to the philologer but a single language. The student who passes from the Hebrew text of the Bible to the Targum which accompanies it, who then turns to the Syriac version, is soon conscious that he sees little more than dialectical varieties. Should he extend his researches to the Quran, he does indeed find himself in a new world. He escapes from the minutiae of the Masora, since the Arabic being a living language, the Muslims have not thought it necessary to mark each subtlety of pronunciation and each delicacy of tone. But he comes upon an elaborate system of inflection and syntax for which his previous studies have given him no preparation. This, the I'rab, or Arabization, is the distinguishing feature and the highest beauty of that classical tongue which is known among Arabs as the language of Mubar. To guide the learner through the intricacies of its system, to demonstrate or imagine the laws which govern it, to reconcile anomalies in what has been written, 
and to lay down rules for future composition have occupied the labors of a multitude of grammarians for nearly twelve hundred years european teachers have shown equal devotion to the form of the classical speech their pupils have been taught to make the study of its delicate mechanism precede even an acquaintance with the vocabulary and many have been thus discouraged by the semblance of insurmountable difficulty yet a little inquiry into the subject reveals this singular phenomenon that these desonances of the verb and noun which are the principal study of the grammarians are unused in ordinary speech throughout nearly all the arabic speaking world this would not surprise us if the language had suffered any corresponding change in its internal structure if there were in fact a modern and an ancient arabic and the desonances had been abandoned with other properties of the old tongue but this view would be fallacious there is really no such thing as a modern arabic language certain words may have dropped out of use or have slightly changed their signification and the excessive redundancy of the vocabulary may have been limited by modern custom but between the earliest arabic versicles which have come down to us and the cultivated language of the present day there is absolutely no grammatical difference everything that is written or that is uttered with any rhetorical intention by an educated man in damascus or cairo in our time is identical to the most minute point with the language of the quran and the learned man is able to speak on occasion with every delicacy of the classical tongue yet not only now but from the age immediately succeeding the first conquests of the saracens the desonances have been omitted by the multitude even of those of pure arabic extraction in syria in iraq in al jazeera or mesopotamia and still more in africa and spain the people as soon as they were removed from the classic influence of the desert dropped the elaborate inflections of the language of modar the corruption extended even beyond this and it is said that as early as the close of the first century of the hijra the powerful khalif al walid ibn abdul malik spoke so incorrectly that he could not make himself understood by the arabs of the desert but in the general disuse of the desonances even by those who otherwise spoke grammatically i cannot but see a sign that they represent something adventitious and almost artificial in the language while in its substance it is identical with the great body of semitic speech in their close relation with each other these languages are kept by the strength of their most remarkable characteristic the triliteral root respecting the mental or phonetic impulse which caused a race to embody its conceptions in words made up of three consonantal sounds to which other sounds prefixed affixed or inserted within gave the necessary modifications it is useless to speculate this much however is clear that it was a general and irresistible tendency and that words which in the most archaic form of the language were monosyllabic and consisted of two consonants were gradually triliterized either by the affixion of a third consonant which is often variable or by the doubling of the second consonant or by the insertion of a vowel sound between them making the so-called concave or hollow verb sooner or later the whole body of the roots was affected with this triliterity and even foreign words were broken and recast in this normal form 
or in quadriliterals of analogous structure. When the triliteral system was complete, the unity of the Semitic languages was forever decided. The limits within which they could vary were fixed, and these were necessarily narrow. Where the three main consonants of each word must be retained under all circumstances of modification and constitute its indestructible substance, there is no longer the possibility of essential variation. It is, moreover, remarkable that the Arabic, which has been destined to survive all the other Semitic languages, and in a manner to include them all, is the most exact in its maintenance of the sanctity of the root. There are in Hebrew many signs of phonetic negligence, and the root appears worn and triturated in the mouths of the people, even in the earliest records that have come down to us. But in Arabic, probably from the more energetic pronunciation of the race, it remains clear and sharp, as if moulded in adamant. For these reasons, we hear from the mouths of millions at the present day, a language which does not fundamentally differ from the oldest Semitic speech of which we have knowledge. The common household words of the modern Arab are not only similar to, but are identical with those of the ancient Hebrew. And it is not too much to say that an Israelite of old and an Arab sheikh of our own time would be mutually intelligible in the expression of simple wants. I have been led to dwell, I hope not with exaggeration, on this fundamental unity of the Semitic languages in order to suggest that Arabic is not to be looked upon as a mere outlandish tongue to be studied only by professed orientalists or by persons who have a levantine or indian career before them but as the most perfect and elaborate form of a speech which in its other varieties has always been considered necessary to the complete education of scholars and churchmen and which is important I may say necessary for the full comprehension even of the Hebrew scriptures. It would, however, be unwise to conceal from the student that in approaching the Arabic language he must prepare to surmount many difficulties. The greatest and most abiding of these, for it is never wholly overcome, arises from the immense number of words which claim a place in it. Years of labour may not secure him from meeting with one or sometimes two or three words in a single line of poetry which he cannot recollect to have seen before, or from which he must seek a different meaning from that which they ordinarily bear. This excessive redundancy arises in part from a minuteness of discrimination which was instinctive among the ancient Arabs and which led them to describe a single object by distinctive names or epithets according to the most trifling variations of its qualities. Thus a camel had appellations according to every accident of age, stature, colour, breed or use, and these, though originally of the nature of epithets, are used alone, and their peculiar signification being often lost, they become simply synonyms of the name camel. A horse was similarly distinguished. A lion, a sword, a beautiful woman had innumerable synonyms. This, however, is intelligible, and there is something like it in every language. Less so is the variety of expressions allotted to one kind of action. I will only cite a single instance. The notion of the miraculous transformation of a human being 
into another creature is expressed by four nearly related roots. A transformation into another man is neskh, into a beast, meskh, into a plant, feskh, into an inanimate, unincreasing object as a stone or a log of wood, reskh. But a more prolific source of this multiplicity is perhaps to be found in the variety of the tribes which contributed to the formation of the literary language. It is well known that each of these had peculiar words and phrases which were unknown to its neighbours, so that even a poet who declaimed before a company of strangers might be interrupted with a demand that he would explain or defend some word that he had used. After the victories of Islam, there was a fusion of the vocabularies of the tribes, as well as of the tribes themselves in the conquered countries, and the words which were thrown into this common stock served as the material for future compositions. The literary pedantry that soon sprang up among the Muslims, and for generations infected the polite societies of Damascus and Baghdad, Basra and Kufa, tended to increase the evil of an excessive idiom. Language was studied for its own sake, rather than for the thoughts of which it was the vehicle. The men of letters delighted in the wilderness of speech amid which they lived, and were careful to encourage its rankest vegetation. They did indeed confer an inestimable benefit on literature by preserving the noble poems of the pre-Islamic period and by commenting them according to the explanations which they received from Arabs of chaste speech. But in their own compositions, they sought to show their knowledge by the use of rare and obsolescent words they had discovered. A name or phrase which was perhaps to be found only in a single poem, the unique utterance of some son of the desert, was adopted and multiplied by the artificial imitators of the ancient style. Yet the learner ought not to be unduly discouraged, even though he seems to be launched forth on a vast and chartless sea of diction. The Arabs have rightly called their lexicon the Qamus, or ocean, and he will in time discover that to have thoroughly explored it is the fortune of a very few, even of the most learned sheikhs. There are writers, even in the present decline of Eastern letters, who still pride themselves on their knowledge of the Arabic vocabulary, who with laborious ingenuity compose with the sole intention of grouping the rarest words they can find in the voluminous dictionaries of the East, or in pagan verses more or less authentic. Such a man is Ferris Eschidiac, who some years since published a book of which the French title is Le Vie et les Aventures de Ferriac, containing much curious learning, but bristling with words which would be unintelligible but for the context. He has his reward in the admiration of those who are faithful to the ancient studies, and I have heard it said by a learned Syrian that Nasif el Yezaji of Beirut is a greater grammarian than Faris Eshidiek, but that Faris knows more words than Nasif. The second great difficulty of the Arabic language is the Arab or Arabization, of which mention has been already made, and which is superadded in the classic tongue to the sufficiently complicated internal changes which affect the structure of the words. The delicacy and precision of this desinential syntax is one of the chief beauties of the language, and gives it a marked preeminence over its sisters. It would be useless here to enter into any disquisition concerning the origin of the desinences, or the comparative antiquity 
of the various forms of Semitic speech. I may, however, state my belief that the Aramaic, which retains much of the monosyllabic character, represents a more primitive type, from which the plentifully voweled and euphonious Arabic is a graceful development. And this may be the case, even though it be proved that in many of its grammatical forms the Arabic preserves for us an older tradition. We find it a settled law in Arabic that a syllable cannot begin with two consonants. In other words, there can be no shivana, a short vowel being always interposed between the two consonants. The abhorrence of rugged sounds has, I think, much to do with the birth of the desonances, which not only introduce precision into the syntax, but lighten the pronunciation and make the language more fitting for the purposes of rhetoric and poetry. Indeed, it is impossible to hear a piece of Arabic read with and without the desonances, and not feel the transcendent superiority of the former, and understand the pride with which the master of such a language would regard his precious inheritance. In sound, there is as much difference as exists between the mellifluous Tuscan and the most rugged Romanic dialect of the Alps, while the syntax gives accuracy to the phrase without recourse to those particles and expletives which make their appearance in the vulgar Arabic dialects. All that we can say with certainty of the Arab is that we find it complete with all its delicate and learned flexions as the possession of the tribes of the Hijaz and of Nejd, and by the time of the Great Awakening to intellectual life, which proceeded by about a century the predication of Muhammad. This indeed is not to say much, but what more can we reasonably assert of a race to which the age of Augustus is prehistoric and that of Constantine still mingles itself with legend? The notion of an ancient Arabic literature of which some fragments are said to have come down to us is, or ought to be, quite exploded. The Arabs, for instance, have preserved what they say is the lament of Amr, son of Al-Harith, son of Mutad, the Jurhumi, who was expelled from Mecca and from the care of the Kaaba and forced to take refuge in Yemen at some remote time. Albert Schultens believed this Amr to have been a contemporary with Solomon and published the verses among his Monumenta Vetustiora Arabiae as Carmen Salamonis Aetatem Attingens. But he probably did not know that the Muslim men of letters were among the most unscrupulous and shameless of forgers, and were in the constant habit of placing snatches of poetry in the mouths of heroes whose deeds they chronicled. The piece in question is in regular meter, determined by the quantity of syllables after the manner of Latin or Greek, and there is reason to believe that this more elaborate form of poetry was introduced at no early period. The conclusion to which we are forced to come is that these verses were probably composed by some versifier under the Khalifs, when the old legends of the people were digested into a regular historical chronicle. But of the prevalence of the Arab among the tribes of pure speech for several generations before Islam, there can be no doubt. Very little examination is requisite to show that the germ of it exists in the other Semitic languages. Thus, though in the Hebrew verb qotal, the last radical is without a vowel, a vowel appears for the easing of the pronunciation when the verb is combined with one of the accusative suffixes. It becomes qatalani. Similarly, with the suffixes to yqtalani. With respect to the noun, traces of the three cases are also to be discerned. 
but leaving these nice inquiries it is enough to say that among the unlettered arabs of the fifth and sixth centuries of our era a language was spoken identical with that which is preserved in the quran in the muallaqat or prize poems said to have been suspended in the kaaba for their especial excellence and in all the other authentic compositions which have come down to us this classic speech in all its purity is universally admitted to have been the possession of the sons of mudar mudar was the son of nizar the son of ma'ad the son of adnan and he begat ilyas who begat tabikha and mudrika and so the traditional genealogy is continued through fir who is also called quraish from whom sprung the most exalted of all the tribes in the opinion of muslims since it had the honor of producing the prophet now this group of tribes for each man in the descent becomes the founder of a new family was with other kindred tribes among which they held a kind of primacy established in the hijaz and tehama the region of mecca and medina and also in nejd or the highland of central arabia at the time when the earliest extant arabic literature was produced there can be no doubt that these spoke with all the grammatical inflections the poetry of the period is a sufficient proof this is composed in regular meters which require for their scansion a rigid observance of the desonances if we read without them it loses entirely the character of verse now the poets were for the most part wholly ignorant of the art of writing they declaimed their compositions before the multitude and the most admired of these were committed to memory by their contemporaries and especially by a class of reciters who went from place to place and gained their living by repeating them therefore even if we admit that there is something not strictly essential to the language in the desonances we must guard ourselves from the opinion that they were a mere literary ornament much less as some unsound european scholars have suggested a device of early muslim grammarians to give precision to the quran quraish was the tribe and mecca was the city which presented the model of this classic speech himyar that is the tribes of southwestern arabia had a more simple inflection the noun being diptotic as in some forms of the classic arabic such as certain of the plurals and the proper names of foreign origin but quraish spoke beyond all doubt with the perfect i'rab as we now possess it the surrounding tribes were also of pure speech ibn khaldun tells us that many of the descendants of mudar lost the faculty of speaking the classic language by dwelling among people of other races the descendants of ma'ad by rabi'a and mudar had in great part recognized the authority of the king of hira who was himself a vassal of the persian monarch and many of them had settled in the northern parts of the peninsula here they borrowed of their neighbors forms and words for this reason he says the speech of quraish was the most eloquent and pure since they were the most remote from the abodes of foreigners next in excellence was the speech of thaqif and hudayl and khuza'a and the banu kinana and the banu asad and the banu tamim but as for the tribes more remote from quraish as rabi'a and lakham and iyad and qada'a and judam and ghassan and the arabs of yemen their speech was imperfect through their intermixture with persians or abyssinians 
it is therefore a settled opinion that the greater or less distance of a tribe from quraysh was the measure of its deflection from the pure language of mudar to this cultivated language islam gave complete supremacy muhammad's revelations were couched in it and though the prophet never versified the rhythm of the quran is indebted to the inflections for much of its beauty the meccan emigrants who gathered round the founder of islam became the chiefs of a monarchy which in a century after the hijra extended from the indus to the pyrenees but it soon appeared that the classic dialect of quraysh was beyond the faculties of the rude tribes which had been brought under the dominion of the khalifs from the very morrow of the death of the prophet difficulties arose respecting the true readings of the quran and when a number of those who knew it by heart were slain in the campaign against an adverse prophet known as Musaylima the liar omar counseled abu bakr to have a standard copy written the recension which is now in use was made by order of the khalif Uthman, who then ordered all discrepant manuscripts to be destroyed but the new copies gave but the simple words without any signs of orthography or syntax the misreadings of this imperfect text were shocking to the ears of the orthodox and zealous companions of the prophet it is a tradition that the khalif ali the most accomplished of the arabs and the author of poems still extant heard a man quote from the quran with a perversion of the dissonance which changed the meaning of the sacred text from quote, god is clear from the sin of the idolaters and his prophet is clear from it end quote. two quote, god is clear from the sin of the idolaters and of his prophet end quote. ali then suggested that rules should be made for the expression of the inflections in writing and for the determination of the exact reading of the Qur'an and Arabic speech in general. He was seconded by able men who knew well the tongue of Quraysh, and thus arose the first school of grammarians, who not only fixed the classic language as we now have it, but founded an elaborate science which has exercised the ingenuity and subtlety of generations more than any study in the encyclopedia of islam it is this classic language on the principles of this original grammar which it is the office of a professor of arabic to expound on this subject i must be allowed to give a decided opinion i believe that for one who desires a real knowledge of the arabic language and literature it is not sufficient to study the grammar as transformed or rather travestied by those european writers who have striven to wrest it to the forms and relations of the latin their purpose has been to make it more familiar and comprehensible and they have taken for granted that the principles to which they were accustomed must be universal and applicable to all languages but the arabic syntax presents divergences from the latin or greek which necessitate a system and nomenclature of its own and the grammarians i speak of can never inform the mind of the learner with clear ideas as long as they insist absolutely on the agreement of verbs with nouns or adjectives with substantives and divide the verb into moods after the fashion of the classic languages even the grammar of the modern european languages has been somewhat perverted and falsified by such theories how much more that of a tongue so peculiar and so independent of foreign influence as the arabic grammar must be the exposition of a speech as it actually exists and this depends on the mode in which a race conceives and expresses its ideas 
the Arabic grammatical system founded on a minute investigation of the idiosyncrasies of the language is exquisitely adapted to the thought of the people and the study of it is the only means of perceiving the true relations of words in composition thus the inflections are particularly fitted to determine the meaning of phrases in such a speech as the semitic which has no long periods nor even the apparatus for forming them but consists of short propositions connected together by some vague copulative particle as v or th which serves to express meanings that are distributed in european language among a whole series of conjunctions thus also the theory of the inchoative and predicate mubtada and khabar a theory which is one of the bases of arabic grammar suffices to give a common principle to a number of various forms of speech if it were only then as an aid to a thorough knowledge of the language i would counsel the student when his first difficulties are past to go boldly to some standard arabic grammar such as the alfiya of ibn malik with the commentary of ibn aqil using sylvestre de sassy's celebrated work as a key to the eastern author but there is a still further necessity for this study grammar among the arabs is more than the handmaid of composition it has been studied for its own sake and indeed seems to have been almost the only original production of the arab intellect it is so unique in its conceptions that we cannot conceive it to have borrowed from anything that preceded it and indeed the system is known historically to have been complete in all its essential parts before the muslims began to receive greek culture the first division of the parts of speech into the noun ism the verb fi'l and the particle harf is attributed to the khalif ali and the fancy of the learned soon seized upon grammatical ideas with extraordinary avidity grammatical disquisitions formed one of the chief amusements of the people in the courts of the khalifs at damascus and then at baghdad the most subtle questions were discussed by the literary in the presence of the commander of the faithful and even the slave girls who sang before the guests were able to pass the lines they recited using all the technical terms of the science and declaring on what authority they used such or such an inflection or preferred one form of the plural to another i may here relate the story of sibaway one of the most famous of the grammarians a persian who visited the court of baghdad in the reign of harun al-rashid a contest had raged between the schools of basra and kufa concerning the use of the raf and nasb or as we should call them the nominative and accusative case of the noun in certain positions sibaway took one side el kisai a grammarian of kufa the other one day in the presence of the khalif sibaway put a question on the subject to his opponent and after a dispute the khalif ordered that a reference should be made to an arab of the desert it was the custom to send for men of the tribes of pure speech often soldiers or grooms and to lead them in conversation to utter the doubtful word or phrase not asking them a direct question which might have confused them they being ignorant men whatever might be determined by their unsophisticated unpremeditated utterance was looked upon as authoritative in this case el kisai by the help of the khalif's son el amin who was his pupil contrived that some men of a tribe of impure speech should be sent for and their utterance was in favor of el kisai's assertion 
Sibaway angrily departed from Baghdad, and according to one account, he would not return to Basra discredited, but repaired to Ehwez, where he made inquiry if there were any prince with a fondness for grammar. He was recommended to Balhat ibn Bahir of Khorasan, and set out for his court, but died on the way, some say, of grief. It is related that a pupil of Sibaway, indignant at the conduct of El Kisei, sought him out and put to him a hundred grammatical questions, convicting him of a mistake in every answer. The point which this enthusiasm for the subtleties of grammar had reached in a later age is indicated in the assemblies of Hariri, still the most popular book among the learned of the East. But in truth, it is impossible to read even the Thousand and One Nights without falling upon some instances of the prevalence of this pursuit. The terms of grammar are introduced into love poems, and they are even played upon in indelicate jests and witticisms. A study of the niceties of speech was the most esteemed pursuit of the Arabic-speaking Muslim, and brought with it higher consideration even than proficiency in divinity or law. The word which expresses this technical literary culture came to be synonymous with the education of a gentleman. End of part one.